Hello, this is Dr. Housinger, and this is chapter three of your Van Warmer text, Substance Misuse, Dependence, and the Body. This part will cover all of the different substances, so buckle in, this is a longer one. We're going to start out at looking at the biological aspect of substance use, and <clears throat> this really goes into the disease argument. Is it a disease? How does addiction change the landscape of the brain? How does it change the physiology of the body? And we can see that um, through PET scans and MRIs, we can look at the differences between addicted brains and non-addicted brains. And what's particularly interesting is looking at sustained abstinence over a period of time. Um, Craving research is one of the is one of the fields where we can really see, and we see this in the DSM five with craving being a criteria as well as looking at it on assessments. Um, that craving fundamentally changes the brain, and that we can see those changes over time in the brain. So the craving research is really one of those avenues for arguing that addiction is a disease because it affects the biology of the body. Okay. So we can see connections between addiction related behaviors and neural structures and functions in the brain. Okay. <clears throat> Another recent trend in the literature and research has been new facts on brain damage, particularly TBIs or traumatic brain injuries and trauma. And you can actually see trauma in the brain in scans. It looks like little nodules, little little bumps, little balls. And it's in the same pathways that addiction are in in the brain. So there is an integral link between addiction and trauma, which is why you often see them go together. It is definitely not a coincidence at all. Okay. So if you do a Google search, it's quite interesting to see uh, addicted brains versus non-addicted brains. Another interesting thing to look at is the spiders on drugs, where you can see spiders were given microdoses of certain substances and then created webs. And you can see what the webs look like under the influence of different drugs. All right. So we're first going to look at the depressants. And alcohol is often in its own category. It is a depressant, um, but it's, it's such a, a huge thing, a huge entity, and acts a little bit differently, um, that it's often in its own category. When we look at uppers, downers, all-arounders, alcohol is often by itself, um, even though it is a depressant. So in general, if we were to look at all the depressants, these include barbiturates, alcohol, and tranquilizers. And in your book, figure 3.1 um, looks at <clears throat> all of the, the ca casualties of alcohol. Okay. Um, <clears throat> certainly for adolescents, alcohol is um, quite damaging in terms of car related car accidents. But one of the things that's not often talked about as much are the um, the number of drowning deaths, okay? um, especially people being at the beach or or swimming and then having you know, uh, a depressed respiratory rate because they've been drinking and not able to swim out of a, a situation. Okay. Right. Um, <clears throat> international studies show a high correlation with partner violence where both offender and victim are drinking. Um, <clears throat> And when we combine that with cocaine, we see that as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> very, very, very high rates of um, reported blackouts when cocaine and alcohol are combined. Okay. Um, the most recent NIA statistic from 2010 shows that college student deaths per year are about 18, uh, 1,800, a little bit over 1,800 with injuries being 600,000 alcohol-related injuries. And so this could be, you know, falling down and scraping your knee or hitting your head. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that is, um, will end you in the ER or something like that. So um, <clears throat> people tripping when they're intoxicated, uh, alcohol, of course, affects gross motor skills. Okay, 
<clears throat> so in the Pacific Northwest, you might be a little bit more familiar with Father Martin, um, who was a Catholic priest and battled alcoholism and became a public speaker and had a lot of different videos on on alcoholism. And his videos and reading materials are still sometimes shown um, at rehab centers, and you can find these on YouTube. I will warn you, though, that they were recorded many, many years ago, and so the language um, is not as PC as what we are used to today. But definitely one of the um, the pioneers for bringing alcoholism and recovery out into the open. Hey. Um, and he classified different types of intoxication um, into the, uh, the jocose drunk, the amorose drunk, the bellicose, and lachrymose drunk. So <clears throat> saying that you know, alcohol affects people differently, and these are some of the drunks that you might see. Right. So <clears throat> the authors of the textbook add a sleepy drunk, a loud drunk, and the know-it-all drunk. So if you think about times that you might have been around people that were drinking, um, there's always these, these characteristics that come up. Okay. So I encourage you to check out those videos. Pretty interesting. Okay. So we have the playful drunk, the I love everybody belligerent drunk, and then um, the mopey drunk. Okay. So expanding from chapter two, global drinking patterns, Europeans consume te six times as much alcohol as Southeast Asians. There's a biological reason for that. Um, <clears throat> people of Asian heritage um, cannot tolerate uh, physically alcohol as much, and it can cause flushing and heart palpitations and uh, people can get quite ill um, if they drink and um, they are Asian. So um, <clears throat> you'll see Asians drinking different types of alcohol and in much more moderation in general. Um, <clears throat> in Moldova and the Czech Republic, people drink around 18 liters per capita each year. And I want you to think about the geographic implications here as well, because not uh, even in 2019, um, <clears throat> we don't necessarily have... Um, clean water for everyone over the world and especially in our own country um, but a lot of places rely on fermented beverages when the water supply is not healthy to drink because uh, of course drinking tainted water could lead to a variety of problems but death okay. um, we see more hard liquor in Eastern Europe and again, think about what grows in different parts of the world. That's where you're going to see different things. So we associate um, the French and Italians with wine because the climate is fantastic for growing grapes. And um, the British and Irish with beer because the climate is fantastic for growing hops, as it is in Washington State. And then in Eastern Europe and um, getting up into to Russia, where things might not grow as much, we see things like potato vodka. Um, we see higher rates in indigenous populations in northern Sweden and northern Canada. Okay. So it's not necessarily limited to a country, but pockets in different areas of the country and populations. Okay. Now, you might have heard the phrase, everything in moderation. Um, <clears throat> there have been many studies that have been conducted about the health effects of moderate drinking, um, and specifically red wine is sometimes recommended by heart physicians. Um, moderate drinkers tend to have heart benefits. They live longer. And here's that word again from chapter one, teetotalers, complete abstinence. They've also found that people that moderately drink tend to have higher levels of happiness than people that don't drink. Okay, so there's a line there. So if we're saying that moderate drinkers uh, tend to have more benefits than people that are completely abstinent, and then of course heavier drinkers, we need to look at what is moderate drinking and where is that line. Okay. Seven to 10% of drinkers get addicted. So this reflects our statistics for addiction in general. And the signs we talked about the DSM-5, tolerance, withdrawals. Uh, DT refers to delirium tremens. So this might be shaky hands, seeing things, hearing things, uh, hallucinations. Um, and then 
heavy nicotine and caffeine use. So if you do go to an AA meeting, you will notice, unless it's a non-smoking meeting, that there's a lot of cigarettes and a lot of caffeine and sometimes a lot of sugar as well. So it's not a coincidence that recovering alcoholics are craving sugar because alcohol is biologically sugar. So <clears throat> when we're looking at brain biology, we have our, our set point for how much a substance will usually kind of, kind of trigger things. And when we talk about uh, dramatic substances like cocaine or methamphetamine, generally the first time that a person uses is the highest that they're, they're going to get. And so <clears throat> when a person uh, is trying to get that rush of neurotransmitters, they're using things to, to kind of mimic that. And so um, <clears throat> sugar, of course, is not as dramatic as cocaine is, but it's still triggering that effect. So when you go to self-help meetings, you will often see people uh, substituting alcohol or substituting whatever the drug of choice is for other substances. And if you speak to people in recovery, a, a lot of people may say that they actually increased their smoking or their caffeine use when they stopped drinking alcohol or with their drug of choice. Tolerance reversal happens generally in late stages of alcoholism in which a person's uh, kidneys and liver might be, um, might be diseased. And what it means is that if a person was used to drinking 10 beers, now the liver and kidneys are not working. And so they, it might just take a couple drinks and they actually feel intoxicated. So generally we see that in later stages. BAC, blood alcohol content. So there's a chart in your Moodle um, talking about this. And we spoke previously about um, you know, what affects somebody's use and biology and physiology do that. So um, there are gender differences. There are um, genetic and hereditary differences and cultural differences. And even what you ate can make a difference. So uh, point four BAC, the person might be comatose. So a person that has never drank before, they would most likely be dead at point four. Um, a point four, if somebody's even standing at a point four, it means that they have had, they've been drinking for a long time and have a high tolerance and have been used to doing things. Okay. Um, so legal intoxication is a point oh eight. Okay. So if a person gets a point one two or a point one six, then a 0.16, of course, is twice the legal limit, which shows tolerance because a person that doesn't drink, they might feel tipsy after one glass of wine. So if you think of all the things that a person would have to do and be used to doing while intoxicated, find their keys, walk to the car, put the keys in the ignition, start the car. Okay? So if a person is, is doing daily activities that are only possible with tolerance, then we know that they've been drinking for a while. And we also use this to look at um, veracity and truth. And not all drinks are the same. So th they talked a little bit about this in chapters one and two. So if a person says, I had one drink and their BAC was a 0.16, was it an entire mug full of vodka? One drink, what does that look like? So um, the blood work, of course, doesn't lie. And so we can tell and we can say, you know, if you got a DUI and, and your BAC was this much, how long and how often and what have you been drinking? Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Tom Sawyer is certainly not an innocent child's novel. Um, there were cases, a lot of drunkenness and a, a lot of things going on in that novel. Um, and if you, you've read it or remember, um, <clears throat> there were clear depictions of blackouts and what that looks like. And it's common at um, a point three. Now, blacking out is not the same thing as passing out. If a person drinks to the point where they pass out, that's the body's defense mechanism kicking in because the person could die. The body is perceiving the alcohol as poison. And so the body says, if I have any more alcohol, I am going to die. So the body shuts, shuts down. Okay, so it's just, it's like game over. It's a power off switch. Okay. All right. Um, and there are a lot of court cases about alcohol. And again, uh, alcohol is present in the majority of domestic violence incidents. Um, <clears throat> and it's important to look at, at the role of alcohol in different uh, court cases. Okay. All right. 
So narcotics. Sometimes narcotics is used as a broad term to mean drugs in general. Um, <clears throat> but if you look at um, narc, narcolepsy, where do we see narcolepsy? Well, with sleep, right? So a depressant, so we can deduce that right from the name of it. Okay. So opiates are from the opium poppy. And there's a couple different types of poppy. Um, there's one that produces opium, and then there's the ornamental ones. And the differences between opiates and opioids are the naturally derived ones versus the synthetic ones. So <clears throat> heroin coming from a poppy plant. Um, and pretty much most substances can be taken in a variety of different ways. Um, orally, topically, smoked, snorted, injected. Heroin is most uh, commonly smoked, snorted, or injected. However, in some countries, they prescribe heroin, not street heroin, but chemical heroin, which is taken either in a liquid or a pill form. Okay. So tolerance, of course, is needing more of more of a substance to get the same effect. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the high tolerance develops, and so people need higher quantities to produce the same high. And where we often get overdoses is when a batch is particularly potent and a person might um, take more than they're used to or they might take the same amount not knowing that it is uh, more potent and can lead to an overdose. We also have overdoses right after rehab, particularly detox is the, the most dangerous time for a heroin addict because in detox the system is flushed, um, it's out of their system, and then if the person goes back out and uses it the same amount, they don't have tolerance anymore because it's not in their system. It's not built up. And so um, if they, let's say a person was doing a gram of heroin a day, goes to detox, and then they come out of detox and they don't have it in their system and they haven't had it for a while and they use that same one gram, they are at an increased risk for overdose. Okay. Well, it's no secret that we have a huge misuse of pain medication and pills are very expensive and heroin is not very expensive. So if a person gets addicted to pain pills, and this is very common, um, people have surgery and then they are not properly shown how to wean themselves off of pills, or it's just take these until they're gone. And tolerance is something that naturally occurs. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just tolerance is a biological, um, you know, chemical process. Um, <clears throat> So one of the, the things, and we'll look at this in policy, is holding doctors responsible for really training people how to wean themselves off of pain medicine and have that as a supervised thing and not just cutting people off of pain pills. One of the increasing problems is that because um, doctors and healthcare systems now are being sued by the families of people that have overdosed, people are just getting cut off from their pain pills altogether when they legitimately mean, need them. And a lot of chronic pain patients feel that they are being targeted or labeled um, as abusers. And so what's happening is they're getting cut off and then people are legitimately in pain and are just told to dealt with it or take ibuprofen and they're committing suicide. And we're seeing a lot of that actually with farmers and people that work in agriculture. And the Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, actually put out um, uh, several web pages about this because it's becoming a problem in that community. All right. So one of probably the most uh, the most common opiates is oxycontin. Um, was developed for cancer patients. Others that you've probably heard of are Percocet and Roxycodone, Oxycodone. So Oxycodone and Oxycontin are a little bit different. And of course, we have Vicodin. Okay, and then heavy duty your ones would be fentanyl and Dilaudid. Okay, another. Classic classification of drugs are stimulants. Um, most well-known ones are cocaine in crack and powder form and amphetamines and methamphetamines. Cocaine in either form comes out of the body very quickly. So that makes sense if you think of the properties of the drugs. Something that makes you fast comes out of the body pretty quickly. It leaves the urine in eight hours. And, of course, uh, we know from the roots of administration, if a person smokes it, it can arrive uh, five to seven seconds. Okay. Um, injection is about 10 seconds. So 
So smoking is actually the fastest way to receive the effects of a drug. Now, the issue with cocaine is that the high only lasts every about 15 to 20 minutes and there's a sharp crash after it. So a person that's chronically addicted to this might have to use every 15 minutes. So if you think about your daily life and work, could you sneak off to the bathroom every 15 minutes without somebody noticing? It's not very, uh, it's not an efficient drug, I guess would be the word. Now what happens here is the brain blocks the reuptake of dopamine um, because it had been flooded, and so we often see a lot of depression here with cocaine. Okay. Right. Um, amphetamines and methamphetamine are synthetic, unlike cocaine. Cocaine comes from a plant, uh, but is highly synthesized. So if you were to take the coca leaves that grow in South America and chew on them, it's they describe it as having 15 cups of coffee, uh, but it's legal. You can pick the leaves. Okay? They sell them at gas stations. Um, unlike uh, cocaine, which is highly synthesized, and if you do a paper on cocaine, look into this, all the stuff they put into it, um, white does not mean pure. They put kerosene and gasoline and petroleum, and it's a very unhealthy substance, just not even just because of the drug, but what they put into it. Um, we don't usually drink gasoline. Um, <clears throat> amphetamines and meth. Um, were used on both sides of World War II. In fact, the kamikaze pilots were under the influence of methamphetamine, uh, and a lot of their bravery came from, from that and being amped up. Um, amphetamines are still sometimes used as nasal sprays, and they were used as a nasal spray or an inhalant for troops. Now, it's a lot longer of a high, 4 to 16 hours, as opposed to 15, 20 minutes, and so it's more economical. Uh, and it's sometimes called the poor man's cocaine because it can last so long. But then again, there is the crash as well. Okay. So they estimate a four to 16 hour high when snorted or injected. So that's a, a big period of time, four to 16 hours versus eight to 24 hour when smoked. Okay. There are a lot of fantastic videos and books out there about methamphetamine. Uh, it tends to be present in rural towns for a couple different reasons. Um, to make methamphetamine can take about an hour, and there, there's some videos on it as well. There's a shake and bake method, um, and the police will say that if you can follow a recipe for chocolate chip cookies, you can follow a recipe to make methamphetamine. And there's different ways that you can do it, of course, um, but it's something that uh, if you have it in a downtown city, people are going to smell it. Um, so it's usually associated with rural areas uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and there are some fantastic videos, again, uh, Methland on Netflix, The World's Most Dangerous Drug, talks about it internationally. And then a lot of the videos, um, Meth Town, uh, Meth USA, are about smaller towns in the United States. Okay. All right. So one of the things that we look at um, not just with stimulants, but with all addiction, is this word here, anhedonia, which is the inability to feel pleasure with drug-induced brain injury. So that's an interesting way to look at it, a drug-induced brain injury. So if a person is taking substances, they can alter their brain chemi chemistry. So here, the brain blocks the reuptake of dopamine, and then the body becomes depleted of dopamine, which of course is one of the um, neurotransmitters that helps us fight depression. So if you look at the word here, hedonia, hedonic, meaning pleasure, and an meaning anti. Um, and we often see this a lot with people that have suffered from alcoholism, um, feeling chronically depressed. And one of the best remedies for that is a natural remedy, which is exercise. Because exercise stimulates dopamine and endorphins, mainly, um, to help somebody feel naturally, naturally well. Okay. And anhedonia in general, and this is not, you know, every case, um, <clears throat> but a person will feel much better and more back to their baseline with about a year of abstinence from that substance and particularly stimulants. Nicotine is often in its own category of drugs as well because it can be both a stimulant and a depressant. 
And this really depends on set and setting and expectations of the user. So we have to really look and take into consideration the environment when we're looking at using substances. Is it out of is it out of desperation? Is it a pleasurable experience? What am I expecting? Am I in a good frame of mind? For example, um, if a person is using mushrooms or a psychedelic, it's probably not a good idea to watch a horror film. Probably not a good idea. Um, whereas uh, maybe a person wants to experience lights and different things, and so they take mushrooms and then they go to the planetarium. Okay, just an example. Okay. Um, so it's estimated that 75% of people in substance abuse treatment programs smoke. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, you'll often hear people say, well, I only smoke when I drink. There is a reason for that. <clears throat> so you have a depressant and then you have a stimulant. And nicotine is going to constrict and restrict the blood vessels. So it reduces alcohol effects so people can drink longer. Also, there's a huge social um, social factor with nicotine as well, because you know, people share. So how many, if you have smoked in the past or are a current smoker, think about times or new people that you've met or conversations that you've had, and there can be a lot less isolation when people smoke. Um, so if, if you're one of those people that I only smoke when I drink, well, that's why. Uh, you can drink longer without feeling the effects of alcohol. Okay, all right. <clears throat> And it's estimated that 88% of people with schizophrenia smoke, which is interesting. Okay, so nicotine decreases BAC levels, so it's very common to see people drinking and smoking at the same time, and then those two behaviors can become associated together. Yes. Um, <clears throat> in this chapter, there's some great supplements about nicotine here in different stories, and the... Um, Tobacco Quit Line is a national hotline, and they will um, sometimes give you free samples of things, and you can talk with a certified quit counselor, and they can help and coach you. Um, at a lot of rehabs, they actually do informed consent. Um, some inpatients allow you to smoke, some don't. Um, and some research actually shows that um, you're 400% more likely to, to quit everything if you quit smoking at the same time, but you quit everything else. So we'd have to look at that data. Um, but there is data out there to support that um, <clears throat> you know, people can be more successful if they stop smoking as well. Because again, we are triggering those neurotransmitters and triggering that pleasure effect in the brain by smoking. And uh, not just nicotine, we, in cigarette form, we also have to look at chewing tobacco. Um, people that chew tobacco are more likely to have uh, mouth cancer. Um, and in some chew, they put fiberglass into it to actually cut into the cheek so that the nicotine goes directly into the bloodstream. Hallucinogens, these are your all-arounders. Um, in indigenous cultures, plants are often used as medicine. Um, and hallucinogens have been used by medicine men and women for thousands of years as ways of communicating with the other world and other realms. Uh, LSD and PCP are synthetics and they're associated with flashbacks. The history of LSD is quite interesting. It was um, developed accidentally and April 19th is Bicycle Day where the principal researcher was trying to figure out what the dose of LSD was, and he thought he took a regular dose, but he took like 100 times the actual dose that he was supposed to take because he was still playing with it, and uh, he rode his bike home under the influence of LSD. So sometimes you'll see that uh, April 19th is bicycle day. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the government, of course, tried to use LSD as a truth serum, and at one point in California, they had an operation called Operation Midnight, where they were um, paying sex workers and prostitutes to lure operatives in um, to get them to confess and use LSD. So really interesting there. Um, not something that you usually see people getting addicted to or causing craving. And if you work with drug users, the people that use hallucinogens, uh, they tend to be quite different. They tend to be quite different. 
and the intention in set and setting tend to be quite different than harder drugs like methamphetamine and heroin as well. Okay, so we see a lot of the party drugs here. Um, ecstasy, yes, it does have stimulant qualities, but it is considered a hallucinogen. And Rufi, Ruhypnol, and GHB also would fall into this category because it heightens the sensory experience like other hallucinogens. So that's why you'll see it paired with colors and lights and scents and things that are, are pulsing. Okay. Um, now, again, like most substances, you can't get back to the original high because the brain changes. You have that peak. Um, <clears throat> they're currently using MDMA in studies to treat PTSD. And ketamine is actually being used. And there are ketamine treatment centers now where you can go for chronic pain, um, for PTSD, for anxiety, and depression. Okay. Dance Safe is one of the first harm reduction agencies. They're from Seattle, but they have chapters all over. And their goal is to reduce harm and to make use safer. You'll often see them in front of rays, and they give out condoms and water and iodine testing kits so that a person can test how pure their ecstasy is. One of the biggest problems um, with pills in particular is you don't always know their source or what they're cut with. So if a person is used to taking pure MDMA and then they have an ecstasy tablet that is cut with heroin or meth and they're not used to that and they take, they take it, depending on what else they're using, they could overdose. One of the challenges um, with ecstasy is that it increases the temperature in the body. And so there, um, people, people may die when they're, this is crude, but the brain boils in the head, basically. Um, people's body temperature can rise too much because they're dancing and they're dehydrated and they're not drinking enough water. And the ecstasy is raising the body temperature to begin with. Um, so a uh, great harm reduction if you're going to a rave would be to make sure that uh, you're drinking a lot of water and take electrolytes. Okay. Uh, natural hallucinogens include peyote and mescaline coming from the cactus. Okay. Um, so again, we're not really going to use ecstasy for spiritual quests. We're going to use more the, the natural in general. Um, ayahuasca and ibogaine are other hallucinogens, and ayahuasca is uh, used in church ceremonies, and there's actually a church of the ayahuasca in Arizona, but ibogaine is a, is a natural occurring hallucinogen that is being used in opiate treatments, and some people find that it's very successful. Most people will go to Canada or Mexico to do that. So looking at what is ecstasy, it is structurally related to amphetamines. It's only about four chemical reactions away, so there is stimulant property there, but uh, it's definitely hallucinogenic as well. I'll give you extra credit if you can say that five times fast. And you'll often find an insignia or the type of ecstasy stamped onto the pill. Okay. So short-term ecstasy, People report feeling confident, um, <clears throat> arousal, sexual arousal, increased heart rate, dry and sore mouth or throat, uh, tension, high body temperature, muscle twitching, and then the crash would be depression and confusing, confusion. Okay. Spice and bath salts are synthetic, meaning that they are created in a lab. They don't naturally occur. Um, spice is marketed as being like um, a marijuana substitute, but it acts quite differently. And then we have bath salts, which is the zombie drug. And you may recall a case in Florida several years ago where there were two homeless individuals and they were using bath salts and they were naked and one man bit off another person's face. Um, it gives people incredible strength and it was such a problem um, in the Navy that the Navy actually put out a PSA because it's difficult to, to detect in UAs and every time a new substance comes out, the chemists have to figure out how do we test for this and how do we, how can we find this in a UA or in a blood or saliva test. Okay. 
way. Um, it's a very unpredictable and gives people a lot of strength. It actually looks a lot like PCP in action, people running into doors, um, the zombie drug. Okay. And people often, their, their motor skills are very disjointed and they might be walking differently, like doing a crab walk or a zombie walk. So it definitely um, looks uh, very dramatic. <clears throat> and people uh, will inject this also. Spice is generally smoked. Um, <clears throat> when we say bath salt, it looks like a bath salt, like an Epsom salt, but it's it's not. It's not. Um, <clears throat> and there's been um, there's been records of people trying to bathe in bath salts, not knowing what they were, and going to the ER. It generally looks like a crystal or an Epsom salt or a spice. Kind of looks like ground up oregano. And they're legal. Another one that's a synthetic um, that's marketed is called jewelry cleaner, and it's not. It's very much like a spice or a bath salt. Okay, cannabis, marijuana. Um, <clears throat> THC is the psychoactive ingredient. And then we have um, CBD. Um, and pure CBD comes from the hemp plant, which does not have THC in it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we have different substances from similar plants. Um, it lowers blood glucose, it increases appetite, and it is fat soluble, which means that it is stored in the fatty tissue. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we've been doing more medical research on cannabis now, and it's certainly become more socially acceptable um, in 2016 to 2019, about 61 to 70 percent of the po of the United States population is for uh, federal legalization. There's been some research to support that cannabis can shrink cancer cells, uh, cancer cells, or, or earlier reports of it causing cancer were not validated, and there are a lot of medicinal and psychiatric uses. And it's become a science now where they can look at sativas and indicas and percentages and this strain will do this and this strain is for this um, and it's become quite a science you know marijuana is also not a stranger to the danger of synthesis we have dabs now which is honey butene oil and so what happens is they take the buds and then they take an extractor with butane and they pull pull all of the THC out. So if you have a marijuana bud and it's sticky, sticky bud, and you can see it's all crystally, they extract all that out. So the THC is in the crystals. And then they take that and they bake it and it's a very sticky honey type substance. So BHO, honey oil, honey butane oil. And then people um, use what's known as a dab rig where you take a torch and you have the little bit of the oil on a nail and you heat up the opening and then you stick the nail in there and then smoke the extraction. Um, the e ERs have been seeing something called dab psychosis, which is where people are too high and it becomes very, very scary. Um, edibles are another thing where um, an edible can last maybe eight hours and they can be quite potent and so people are, are freaking out because they've never been that high before and really the only thing that you can do is wait, wait until you come down. Okay. So this is certainly regional, um, <clears throat> and we'll talk more about this in policy, what affects drug costs, and it's partly supply and demand and the weather and politics. Um, crack cocaine, so cocaine in rock form, not powder form, can be 5 to $10 per rock, per rock, and it can last 30 minutes, maybe only 15 to 20 minutes for prolonged use. Um, <clears throat> heroin could be potentially 100 to $200 a day, $20 maybe for a little bag. Um, pills, however, though, generally go for about a dollar a milligram. So if a person is using a Perk 30, that is $30 per pill. So if they're using 10 pills a day, that's $300 a day. And then you multiply that times seven, that's a lot of money, whereas heroin is much cheaper. Okay, um, Ecstasy, $25 for several pills. Again, it's going to depend on the, the quantity and quality. And methamphetamine is a very long-lasting high, um, potentially days for $25. Okay. 
And we're going to see it in different populations. Um, <clears throat> can be a, a party drug, and then it can also be used to increase productivity. And in the Midwest, in the early 2000s, um, we're seeing um, a resurgence of meth. So every drug has an epidemic every generation. A generation is about 20 to 25 years. So nothing ever really completely goes away, but we see these balloons and these bubbles of drugs uh, come out. So, <clears throat> you know, we have a heroin epidemic and then we have a cocaine epidemic. Well, we're on schedule again for another meth epidemic. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and we, off, we often see, and we did see in the early 2000s, and we'll probably see again, an increase of methamphetamine use among young mothers using it to lose weight, but also to give them the energy to clean their house and take care of their children. And marijuana has actually decreased in price because it is legal now and because there is so much of it. And in 2018, the state of Oregon had about one to two million dollars worth of inventory that they can't sell. And so there, some stores were actually giving it away. Um, an ounce of marijuana, 10 or 15 years ago might have been $200. You can get ounces for $60 now. And a lot of these uh, rec stores have deals. So it's really interesting to see, you know, this is a policy issue, how policy affects drug prices. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about metabolism, um, basic physiology. So you have your organs of excretion, if you remember from 7th or 8th grade biology class. So our liver metabolizes alcohol, and alcohol circulates in the bloodstream until metabolized. So that's where we have our blood alcohol content, right? How much we have. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I mentioned a little bit earlier that men and women are different. So <clears throat> men have higher concentrations of the alcohol-destroying enzyme in their stomach. Women don't have as much of it until they get to uh, the intestinal systems. And so right away, when a man drinks alcohol, the enzymes start to break down. So this is why a man might not feel the effects of alcohol as much and could potentially drink more. Whereas a woman, they're going to feel the effects of alcohol sooner because the enzymes are not in that part of the digestive system as much. So in general... Um, we metabolize a half an ounce per hour, so like a small glance of a small glass of wine. And a drink is not equal. Okay, so all of these we're looking at about 5.5 AV content. So a drink would be a quarter of one bottle of beer, 12 ounces. Okay, um, <clears throat> one glass of wine, a single drink an ounce of liquor or uh, some shot glasses like are an ounce and a half. So we have to look at how much is a person drinking, what are they drinking, how much, and how often. Okay, so if you're drinking 16 ounces of beer, that's more. That's not one drink. It might be one physical drink because it's one body, one bottle, but biologically and chemically speaking, it's not. Right, so BAC is one per 1,000 parts of blood. Okay. Um, <clears throat> antabuse is one of the medications in which um, would cause a person to be very, very, very sick. So this is often used as an insurance policy or during aversion therapy treatment, which is where a person would um, drink alcohol knowingly having taken antabuse and then experience the violent sickness. Um, with the hopes that it's now associated in the brain with something that's not pleasurable, but something that is uncomfortable. Okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> in the liver, the enzyme that works on alcohol is called alcohol dehydrogenase, and this makes the conversion of alcohol to we're going to try to pronounce this, acetaldehyde, there we go, <laughs> which is a poison. <laughs> and this is located on page 124. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so 
<clears throat> throughout chapters one and two and throughout the rest of the book, we're going to look at differences and um, you know, different areas of the world, different physiologies. We have uh, biological differences, of course. Um, <clears throat> and he mentioned that we have flushing um, <clears throat> and potentially heart pal palpitations and some people break out in hives when they drink alcohol. So we're going to see different types of alcohol in Asian countries and you're going to see probably lower levels of alcohol, but higher levels of things like opiates. Okay. Potentiation occurs when we have two of the same types of drugs. So for example, if a person has a Benadryl, which is a sedative, and then drinks alcohol, they're going to feel a lot sleepier than if they just had the Benadryl by itself or they just had the alcohol by itself. And I've had several clients over the years that got DUIs for drinking one drink and having had taken antihistamines or Benadryl and their BAC might have been a 0 0.04 or 0 0.06, but they still had to come to class and learn about uh, drug interactions, um, which is pretty interesting. So um, it's important during allergy season, of course, that if you are drinking, you make sure that you're spacing things apart and that you don't put yourself at risk for a DUI, even if you're not legally intoxicated in terms of BAC. In cases of overdose or suicide attempts, we might see people combining alcohol and, uh, and Tylenol, like vodka and Tylenol, um, which can cause liver failure and shut the body down. Um, I'm sure that we're all familiar with cele celebrity accounts of mixing substances, which has led to a lot of deaths, accidental deaths, like mixing benzodiazepines, uh, Valium, um, and alcohol. So when we have uppers and downers, it's not uncommon for people to take an upper and a downer. And we, we do it too. Um, if you have an energy drink or a cup of coffee in the morning to wake up and get started, and then you have a glass of wine or a beer at night to wind down, that's exactly the same thing, um, only we might see someone, you know, taking Valium to come down from cocaine, which is not as extreme as, you know, coffee and wine. All right. And if you're interested in more of the BAC, there's a great chart on page 126, Knowing Your Personal Limit, and it's broken down by weight and um, male, female. Okay. It says if you've had so many drinks in so many hours. Okay. All right. Okay, so looking at brain and addiction, page 128 of your book, this chart is from NIDA, and the brain is broken up into several different regions. And this doesn't have the scientific names for the brain on it, but the regions. So this is the reward. The reward and memory center way in the middle of the brain here and um, this is where um, they believe addiction lives or way deep in the old part of the brain and we have um, memory judgment prefrontal cortex movement sensations uh, vision and coordination and um, certain drugs will affect different parts of the brain in different capacities so one of your upcoming assignments is to draw um, what happens in the brain at the synapse level and the, and the big brain level when somebody takes marijuana. Um, and we see this on pages uh, 128 through 131 with the, pathway, the pathways and what the receptors actually look like. Okay. So ecstasy and the brain so note that all drugs just affect the brain and body, but they will work on um, different s systems or different parts of the brain. Okay, and ecstasy, ecstasy long-term ecstasy, can actually cause dementia, and your brain can look like Swiss cheese. Um, there's a great book by a woman named Lynn called "Rolling Away: My Life on E," and they show pictures of her brain scans. She was 21 and had. Um, really prolonged ecstasy use and her brain looked like that of a 70 year old dementia patient and part of her recovery was to do crossword puzzles and play scrabble and sudoku and things like that to start to rebuild those synapses in the brain she had lost whole chunks of memory 
and chunks of learning because of her use. Okay. So with ecstasy, we see the hippocampus, amygdala, the basal ganglia, neocortex, and hypothalamia, hypothalamus. So thinking about <clears throat> these parts of the brain, so if somebody is using ecstasy, um, <clears throat> the sensations and visions are increased. Okay, um, <clears throat> Movement, oftentimes this is paired with dancing um, and perhaps sex. This is something really physical, so we're already generating heat in the body. And then the crash is going to affect... Um, coordination, of course, feeling physically depressed, emotionally depressed, okay, and dehydrated. Okay. So this is a cellular depiction, uh, neurotransmitters affecting emotion and memory. So we have dopamine and the dopamine receptor, and here is where that uh, transaction occurred. You can see a clear image on page 130 in your book. In the normal communication process, dopamine is released by a neuron into the synapse where it combines with dopamine receptors on neighboring neurons. Normally, dopamine is then recycled back into the transmitting neuron by a specialist protein called the dopamine transporter. So here we have dopamine and then we have the receptor. So normally, if it's not used, it will go back in. If cocaine is present, it attaches to the dopamine transporter and blocks the normal recycling process, resulting in a buildup of dopamine in the synapse, which is right here, resulting um, that contributes to the pleasurable effects of cocaine. When cocaine enters the brain, it blocks the dopamine transporter from pumping dopamine back into the transmitting neuron, flooding the synapse with dopamine. This intensifies and prolongs the stimulation of receiving neurons in the brain's pleasure circuits, causing a cocaine high. Okay. Um, and what happens with these substances is that more dopamine than normal is released. So if you, you know, if you exercise, you'll get a flood of endorphins and you'll feel good. If you do cocaine, it'll be like exercising times a million, but that's not normal the body usually doesn't release that much and so that's where one of the problems lies uh, it's such an overwhelming feeling and it's all built up here rather than coming back in which can with long-term use lead to dopamine uh, depletion because it's not being returned neurotransmitters with emotions and memory so dopamine reuptake can be affected by cocaine, which then blocks the dopamine synapse with depletion afterwards, and nicotine also affects dopamine. In this chapter, there is a chart that shows which neurotransmitters work, work on which substances. Um, for the CDP exam, you need to know more of the classifications of drugs and the major neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, GABA, etc. Um, not the lesser known ones, but the main ones. Um, now, we see Parkinson's when we have too little dopamine. And it's interesting because uh, we'll have dopamine boosting drugs for Parkinson's, but that increases mania and gambling behavior. Okay, so we see um, people that didn't previously have gambling issues that were diagnosed with Parkinson's might develop gambling problems because of the medication that stimulates dopamine. Okay, so. What you can surmise from all of this is that we have problems when we have extremes, when we have too much or when we have too little. When the brain's working optimally, we're well balanced. Okay. Now, if we have too much dopamine, then we might have schizophrenia. And if you think about schizophrenia, we have um, <clears throat> people are seeing things that aren't there or hearing things that aren't there. There's overstimulation. And serotonin is another one. It's influenced by alcohol and involved in sleep. So when people stop drinking, they might have difficulty sleeping for a period of time. And with use in general, um, with decreased levels of serotonin, we see depression, anxiety, aggressiveness, impulsiveness, and suicidal behaviors. So this is interesting because we might say, well, is the person drinking because they have an anxiety disorder or is the drinking making them anxious? 
And I cannot tell you how many times I see people that, that have drinking problems that say, well, I'm on antidepressants and they don't work. Well, they're not going to work because you're, canc you're canceling it out. You're depressed, so you were given an antidepressant, but now you're drinking, which is a depressant, so your antidepressant isn't going to work isn't going to work and you're going to feel more depressed. Okay. Right. So sometimes we're going to see these, um, <clears throat> well, I don't feel anxious when I drink and then they stop drinking and they feel more anxious. Uh, and then is it, is it an underlying chemical imbalance or was the drinking causing the chemical imbalance? Okay. So this is why it's so important to have co-occurring treatment. And earlier you saw that um, there is a correlation between uh, suicidal behavior ideology and suicidal attempts with alcohol. Okay, so I mentioned right when we started that there's some fantastic brain scans out there that really depict what's going on and you can see them over the course of time and you can see um, how the brain, which areas of the body, uh, which areas of the brain rather, have increased or decreased activity. So the right scan is from someone that's currently using and the loss of red area shows that uh, there's less glucose and it's less active. Okay, And that means that it can disrupt many different brain functions. So we see more black here, more purple, but a lot less red. So I encourage you to look at those brain scans. They're quite fascinating. Um, and what might scare you and should scare you is that Sugar might have more effects on the brain than cocaine does. And they've done some brain scans where they take um, a person just like this that has used, used cocaine and they've had a year abstinent and they show what that brain looks like and then what it would look like with a relapse. And then they have a sugar addict that has been abstinent for a year and then they have sugar after a year and their brain lights up about two to three more times than the cocaine brain does. Uh, do not underestimate the power of sugar. Um, <clears throat> some scientists believe that it is actually a stronger addiction than cocaine. Okay. All right, uh, memory and craving. So going back to what we previously looked at in terms of craving research and something that we're gonna call euphoric recall. Um, and this is where aversion therapy comes into play. So in general, for a person that is addicted, when they remember using their substance, they might actually feel high or they, they'll feel good or maybe a song or a house that they use in or something triggers that and they might feel really good. That's called euphoric recall. Generally, people don't um, automatically think of the worst time that, the, that they ever use. Certainly, if you use something and had a bad trip and had a really bad experience, that might be the first thing that you'd think of. But in aversion therapy, which is based in cognitive behavioral therapy, or sorry, based in conditioning with behavioral therapy, um, they're trying to, to look at, okay, so alcohol was originally associated with something that was pleasurable. Now I want to make it associated with something unpleasurable so that if I get a craving, I'll automatically be repulsed. And that's where antabuse comes in. And in some cases, they use electroshock therapy as well. So when a person uses, they never get the original high. The brain has then changed. Um, there's a saying with crack cocaine, ringing the bell. And once your bell is rung, you can never get back up to that stage again. Okay. And this is one of the basis for looking at addiction as a brain disease. So the cues can trigger memories. So it could be anything really. And so if you ask somebody, well, what triggers you? Uh, mowing my lawn on a sunny Sunday afternoon. I always used to have a beer mowing my lawn. And now when I look at the lawn mower, I want to drink and I know I can't. So it could really be anything. And so it's important to look at those cues and then help helping to make new associations. Okay. And there's certainly medication that can help reduce cravings. Um, <clears throat> Prozac is one of those that reduces cravings by regulating serotonin levels. So it's not uncommon for somebody to be put on an antidepressant as well. But again, it's only going to work if the person is abstinent from that depressive substance. So the buzzword here is euphoric recall. Okay. A person's not automatically necessarily going to think of something bad until we, we make that connection. 
All right. Mm. So another depiction of cocaine in the brain. This is from NIDA, um, <clears throat> National Institute on Drug Abuse and the National Institute of Health. There's some great resources here. So when you're working on your papers or other projects, I encourage you to go here. Okay. So we just described what that looks like. Okay. Normal versus abnormal. Okay, so then what eventually happens is the body's used to having it recycled. It's all stuck in here because it's been blocked by the cocaine. So we feel really, 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 really good and then we crash because it's not being moderated back in. Okay. So in addition to talking about substances, we need to talk about the behavioral addictions as well and what that looks like. So particularly um, gambling. And as I mentioned previously, gambling and substance abuse can go hand in hand because if you're in a casino, you might be getting free drinks. And sometimes people pair stimulants with gambling so that they can gamble for hours and hours and hours. So when looking at brain scans of people with gambling issues, it looks like they may have abnormal levels of dopamine and serotonin, okay. um, which can, if you remember from a couple slides ago, impulse control and self-regulation are governed here. Okay, so we might have a lack of control. Um, <clears throat> and later on in the course, you'll watch a video about the, psych the psychology of gambling and what that does. Um, <clears throat> and the highs are enhanced when the rewards are uncertain. Am I going to get this time? I don't know. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> And a near miss, like, oh, I, I almost lost, but I got it, could be especially thrilling to think of that um, in terms of an adrenaline junkie, a near miss. Um, and we are seeing more and more co-occurring treatments for gambling addiction um, <clears throat> and more women coming to treatment for gambling as well. Um, <clears throat> more men are affected by gambling than women. Women tend to have more shame and guilt and gamblers, problem gamblers, actually have the highest suicide rate even over alcoholics because of the shame and guilt associated with gambling, particularly in regards to large financial losses that affect a person's family. Okay. So one of the debates is how genetic is addiction and how hereditary is it? Is, can it if my dad has blue eyes and I have blue eyes and my dad has an addiction, do I have an addiction? Um, so they looked at this through a couple different ways, through mental health hospitals and prisons. 50% um, of people who use substances also had mental disorders. That actually might be a little, a little low because a lot of things go undiagnosed. Twin studies and adoption studies have really helped the research and look at uh, is it nature or is it nurture? So that's the argument here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> they had uh, 259 people, uh, males with alcoholic fathers. Okay. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> now there's a couple of different, and this study is on page um, 138. So <clears throat> this study shows that genetics play a big role um, and that environmental factors do not necessarily matter. However, there's always um, caveats to that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and they did a, a follow-up study on that as well um, that showed the opposite. They did another Swedish study of adoptees whose biological fathers had alcohol problems, and it showed that environmental factors did, did matter. They had over 18,000 adoptees. The adoptees with biological parents with alcohol problems had double the risk of developing similar problems, but when their adoptive families were unstable in terms of criminal activities and substance use problems, the adoptees already at risk due to genetic factors were significantly more inclined to develop substance use problems themselves than were adoptees who grew up in more stable environments. So they're saying that genetic risk could be compounded by unhealthy environmental factors. So. When we're looking at theories of addiction, um, nature and nurture, it's often not just one. Okay. All right. 
Um, now, cl- the Cloninger study looked at two different types of um, alcoholic behavior. One was late in onset, um, which was most uh, 75% of the alcoholics, meaning that um, <clears throat> there might have been a, a precursor incident that related to harm avoidance, anxiety, or guilt. Um, <clears throat> maybe a person went through a divorce and they started using drinking as a coping mechanism or a life change. And then the second type, um, would be more hereditary, um, passing from father to son in this study, and is associated more with low levels of serotonin and dopamine in the brain. Okay. And so this might be the person that is an earlier drinker. In this Cloninger study, it started around 11. And there were other things going on as well as hyperactivity, um, antisocial behavior, and then uh, genetics as well. Um, now it's important to differentiate that because not all alcoholics, of course, are the same. Not everybody is the same. So some treatments are going to work for some and others not. Um, so for example, this medication on on Dan Citron, there we go, works on serotonin. So we see, um, if it's hereditary and biological in the brain, but wouldn't necessarily work with behavioral. Twin studies are interesting because we can look at identical twins and fraternal twins. And most of the studies show that there's about 40 to 60% concurrence of alcoholism. And they've also looked at monkeys as well. Um, separated at birth, monkeys drinking more under stress or people with low dopamine um, liking stimulants. And so what they found was with fraternal twins, which would be two eggs, two sperm, is pretty much 50-50. If one twin had an addiction that the other would or would not, 50-50. And then with identical twins, that's different because it's the same egg and the same sperm and they split. So if an identical twin has an addiction, uh, more than likely the other twin is also going to have an addiction. So twin studies and adoptive studies really were a breaking point in figuring out what exactly, how much is the role of genes. So about 40 to 60%, we could make it an even 50. Um, <clears throat> but what's interesting about the Cloninger study and the subsequent study, it shows that if you are predisposed for this during times of stress and unrest, you're more likely to go to this because you're vulnerable. So using the word vulnerable or the word predisposed is a great way in looking at addiction. So for example, if you have a family where you have lots of hypertension and uh, maybe diabetes and other heart issues, am I gonna get it? Not necessarily, but I am predisposed to it, I'm vulnerable to it, so it would be in my best interest to make lifestyle choices based off of knowing that, hey, if I get sick, um, my heart might not work as well. Okay, so it's good knowledge to have. Okay, so if you have something that runs in your family, it's not a you're going to get it. It's you're more likely to than somebody else. And so then the responsibility becomes what am I going to do knowing that I have this information uh, to keep myself healthy. And we can look at addiction like that too. So if you're predisposed to addiction and it runs in your family, what are ways that we can reduce risk and increase protective factors? And then we see um, ADD and ADHD, uh, people having a higher risk for drug abuse. Um, and, and people are at a higher risk as well uh, for, other, for other things like antisocial activity. They did a study of youth sociopaths, and there's a fascinating documentary on the BBC about this, um, <clears throat> where they looked at, at brains of children with ADD and ADHD. And so, um, being hyperactive. However, in certain parts of the brain, certain parts of the brain were actually grossly underutilized and were not firing off. They were underactive, whereas other parts were overactive, um, which is quite interesting. Right? And um, there's a clinician in the UK that believes that they can actually take children that are displaying antisocial or pre-serial killer behaviors and with antidepressants um, and other medication and cognitive behavioral therapy and DBT actually teaching empathy. And they've, they've had some success with children um, that were hurting the family pet, hurting other 
other family members or their younger siblings with the medication and therapy actually developing empathy and no longer doing that. Okay. <clears throat> Medical consequences of addiction are absolutely huge. Um, <clears throat> this brings us to page 141 in your text. Okay. Um, by far and large, there are many more people suffer from alcohol use disorders compared to drug use disorders, and both are more common in men than women, which can lead to the increased stigma of women um, with addictions, and particularly um, with women being the primary caretaker. Um, alcohol is the highest demand for treatment of substance use disorders. Um, <clears throat> Um, and about 3.3 uh, million net deaths, or 5.9% of all global deaths, were attributed to alcohol consumption. It could be car-related, it could be cancer-related, it could be heart-related, it could be accident-related. Okay. So there's a lot of great resources in this chapter about medical consequences. And on page 143, there are some other brain scans for you to look at as well. Okay. <clears throat> On page 142, we have these different consequences here. Um, Wernicke syndrome is characterized by paralysis of normal eye movements, mental confusion, and problems with walking and balance. Okay. And this results from bleeding in the lower sections of the brain, including the thalamus and hypothalamus. These areas of the brain control the nervous and endocrine systems, and the bleeding causes brain damage that presents symptoms involving one's vision, coordination, and balance. Okay. And both Wernicke syndrome and Korsakoff psychosis are thought to derive from a lack of thiamine or vitamin B1 associated with long-term heavy drinking. Okay. So we do need to look at the nutrition here and the supplements. Um, <clears throat> and there is a, um, a recovery cookbook author who was in recovery from alcoholism and wrote an entire series about eating right for being in recovery. Um, diet is one of the things that is not often stressed in treatment. Um, we really need to look at that, especially when we can see here that um, if you're depleting the body of vitamin B, we, we can take vitamin B. Um, <clears throat> um, we can do things nutritionally to help the optimal brain and body functioning. Korsakoff psychosis relates from damage to areas of the brain important to memory function. Wernicke syndrome is often associated with peripheral neuropathy or damage to the peripheral nerves. Okay. Um, and Korsakoff psychosis is sometimes called the Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Um, and it, you might have heard this called wet brain. It's a long-term result of brain damage, and people with this disease experience much confusion and severe short-term memory de deficits. They might not be able to retain information. Uh, confabulation or making things up is a unique characteristic that involves fantasizing to fill in the gaps of memory. Um, although the tall tales seem to be ridiculous fabric fabrications or downright lies, there appears to be no method in the madness other than an inability to distinguish fact from fiction. Although individuals with this affliction can become paranoid on occasion, they generally have a carefree unconcern about the present or future. Other medical consequences, we spoke a little bit earlier about this, liver damage. Because the liver is the main filtration um, organ in the body, if it becomes overburdened with toxins and does not work properly, then it can actually have the opposite effect. Um, and the body basically begins to become poisoned. Okay. Um, and then we have bile in the bloodstream. Um, jaundice is very common, especially in late stage alcoholism. The skin might turn yellow or gray. Um, a person actually might have yellowish or gray eyeballs and bloodshot eyes. And then we have a cirrhosis of the liver, which is where the liver is breaking down and then the immune system breaks down as well. The heart can be affected by nicotine and cocaine. It is not uncommon for people to have strokes um, <clears throat> or heart related issues as well from cocaine. Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol effect. Um, <clears throat> fetal alcohol syndrome is the more severe version of fetal alcohol effect. 
and this can be found on page 146 of your text, um, figure 3.7, where we have actual, not only mental um, and cognitive issues, but physical issues created by drinking um, during pregnancy. In general, we might see a smaller head circumference, the eyes might be smaller, um, the mid face is smaller with a thin upper lip, skin fold at the corner of the eye, a low nasal bridge, a short stout nose, um, and then the philtrum, which is the groove between the nose and the upper lip, might be indistinct. Um, it's estimated that about 40,000 children in the U.S. are born with fetal, fetal alcohol problems each year. Some estimates show that um, in Russia, up to 50% of the population might have fetal alcohol effect. Um, fetal alcohol syndrome disorders are an umbrella term describing the range of effects that can occur in an individual whose mother drinks during pregnancy. Right. And more about this can be found on page um, 147 and also goes into marijuana and nicotine effect in utero as well. Okay. So in addition to the physical symptoms, um, learning can be difficult. It can result in a lower IQ. Okay. Um, and not only um, should we be thinking about the, the mother's actions of drinking, but looking at the role of sperm as well in that. Okay. So looking at biological, if we're looking at addiction as a biological phenomenon, what do we do? Uh, there is a treatment center in Seattle called Chick Shadle, and they do aversion therapy, which is where they're trying to associate the use with something that is unpleasant. So for example, they'll have clients take antifuse and then um, drink alcohol and then vomit. Um, and they use electroshock therapy, but they also do cognitive behavioral therapy, emotional therapy, um, they combine a lot of different treatments, but they use aversion therapy um, because it's rooted in conditioning. So if the body's conditioned, can we make it un unconditioned? Okay. All right. Um, they use a variety of pharmacological interventions as well as behavioral interventions and counseling. Okay. So I encourage you to check out their website. Uh, it's a different treatment approach. It's often criticized because it's very different from about 90% of what's done in treatment centers and they use a combined approach. Okay. So looking at how the body changes brain chemistry, um, the term brain lock was coined by Schwartz, meaning that uh, we need cognitive treatment for obsessive compulsive disorder to, re to rewire the brain. Brain lock meaning we're so fixated on something we can't get past it. Okay. Um, and that's largely what aversion therapy is used for, the hope that we're rewiring the brain. Mentioned earlier in the Cloninger study, we have Ondansetron, which is a medication that decreases craving mainly when serotonin is depleted, not so much uh, with the type uh, 1 alcoholic. Sure, most people have heard of or seen the ads for Chantrix, which helps a person produce more dopamine. Um, now we know that dopamine increases um, vision and memory, so it's no surprise that Chantrix increases lucid dreaming and people have very realistic dreams as if uh, they were awake. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if we look at harm reduction, nicotine gum and the patch are a great example of harm reduction um, that when we think about harm reduction, we might automatically think of needles, but in fact, if you've ever used the gum or the patch to try to quit smoking, you have employed a harm reduction technique. Okay. Now, naltrexone is um, an opiate. Uh, it works on opiates. Okay. Um, it's been approved since 1995. It's also used for alcohol cravings. Um, low dose naltrexone is used for chronic pain, for weight loss, and for a variety of things. It's a very safe drug. Um, the Sinclair method uses naltrexone 
for a biological process called pharmacological extinction. And they believe that uh, extinction happens if you've been using this method for about three to four months. So a person that wants to drink every day, but they no longer want to be a problem drinker, they would take the pill about an hour before they drink. And then they would drink their usual drink and then they would chart and see, am I drinking more? Am I drinking less? How do I feel? This works really well on itself, but it can also work very, very well when paired with a counseling intervention. And the word intervention, as we use it in class, doesn't mean intervention like we see on TV. Intervention in a medical sense just means that it's the tool that we're using. So for example, if somebody had cancer, chemotherapy might be the medical intervention. Okay, so with naltrexin, the person would take it an hour before, and then it would take the brain back to a pre-addiction stage so that they could continue drinking as long as they take the naltrexin. Um, there's a great documentary on Amazon Prime called One Little Pill that talks about this, but I also encourage you to, to look into the Sinclair method. Um, <clears throat> it can be particularly helpful for binge drinkers or for people that want to reduce their drinking but are having difficulty doing that. Right. Um, it's an opiate blocker. So there's a difference between an antagonist versus a blocker. Okay. Um, <clears throat> naloxone, which is Narcan, is um, <clears throat> the antagonist. So it, what basically it means is that it's going to make it not work. Okay. So whereas if we look at the synapse, um, this is going to block the receptors so that you can't use. Um, whereas and <clears throat> the other one will actually bring somebody up from the brink of death. Okay, so you have naltrexone and then you have naloxone, which is Narcan. Okay, so you might hear this uh, synthetic pres prescription drugs for addiction is often called MAT or medication assisted therapy. It is a form of harm reduction. One of the most widely used ones that have been around for a really long time is methadone, methadone which is a synthetic form of heroin. Um, methadone maintenance would evolve, involve a person that has a history of opiate addiction, regardless of the opiate, um, having monitored doses of this in which they um, can wean down or taper is the word and potentially come off of it. But some people don't. Some people stay on it for life. Um, but it allows people to live functional lives. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the difference between helping versus enabling. But what happens here is that taking a pill or methadone also comes in a liquid form um, under the supervision of a medical professional every day is a lot less harmful than going to buy drugs, inject drugs, smoke, smoke drugs, being around potentially um, violent and sexually violent behavior um, or doing things to get your, your drug that would put yourself at risk. Okay. In some countries and some, um, some places like Vancouver, um, a person for whom methadone is not working um, or a very highly addicted person, they can get prescription heroin. Okay. And it's not street heroin. It would be in the pill form in a doctor's office. So um, buprenorphine also, um, you might see this as Suboxone or Subutex. It can come in a pill form or a film, like a Listerine film. Uh, it can be prescribed by a general practitioner. It reduces the likelihood of an overdose and helps with craving. Okay. Um, <clears throat> eating disorders are associated with um, dopamine deficiencies, and so it's not uncommon for an antidepressant or other medication to be prescribed for that. Um, bulimia is largely related to depression where anorexia is related to anxiety. It's even in the name anorexia nervosa. Okay. Um, and several medications, including Luvox, Prozac, and Paxil can decrease binges. There are a variety of holistic treatments as well. Um, I'm going to reiterate this. We can look at all the theories of addiction and we can look at all the treatments, but in general, and I've said this before, it's more helpful to attack it from all different angles. So if you were trying to train for a marathon, certainly running and increasing your exercise is going to help that. 
but adjusting your diet and then maybe having some encouragement or coaching is going to help rather than if you just ran. So if we did three things to help instead of one, we're going to have greater results. And the same thing is with addiction treatment. So there are a variety of herbs that can help. Um, and if we look at the different substances, for example, methamphetamine is often associated with nutritional deficiencies, um, especially um, vitamin B, all the vitamin Bs and vitamin C. So we need to look at how the drugs affect the body. And um, again, we just spoke with, about alcohol and B1. So that's something that you can take. St. John's wort um, has been helpful for addiction. Hypnosis has been helpful. We might associate that right off the bat with smoking cessation. Um, acupuncture is something that you see more and more in treatment centers where an acupuncturist comes in. Um, a lot of the points for addiction are in the ears, so it's very easy to do a group acupuncture session with not too much cost to the treatment center, and some people even donate their, their skills for this as well. Massage is great, and what, one of the things that happens with addiction is that people can get very uncomfortable with their body and have an out-of-body experience, so to speak, and so massage can be something that can really help a person know what's going on in their body. Um, when we look at especially um, painkillers, one of the things that can happen with prolonged painkiller use is that the person, once they stop, will have an irregularly heightened sense of pain. So a hug could feel like 10,000 needles or a burn, which is not normal. Um, and so some of these things can, and that's temporary, uh, some of these things can, can really help with that. Okay. And I mentioned before exercise, not only as a way to reduce tension, but actually to get the endorphins and brain chemistry going in a healthy, normative fashion, um, especially for alcoholics. Um, <clears throat> there is a high correlation between um, people that are addicted to stimulants and ADHD or ADD. And a lot of these individuals don't want to go on medication because they might have abused amphetamine-based medications such as Ritalin or Adderall in the past. Um, I've had several clients adapt really strenuous and rigorous physical exercise regimens to manage their energy because they were afraid of a relapse or abusing their medication if they switched from an illegal drug to a medically supervised amphetamine. Um, so yoga is also really great and you'll see a lot of treatment centers now with yoga. Um, I've taught yoga in treatment centers and prisons and jails myself um, because it really helps the inner, inner outer body connection and it increases self-soothing behaviors and decreases impulse control. And what we know from this chapter is that addiction and certainly other substances more than others affect that self-regulation and impulse part in the brain. Okay, so a lot of good stuff in this chapter. Please pay specific attention to the neurotransmitters. Look at the, the charts about how uh, different substances affect the brain. And there are a lot of great diagrams on the NIDA website for particular drugs about neurotransmitters and what each substance does and which neurotransmitter it acts on. Dr. Housinger out.